sure. No, I'm sitting right there. You can sit right next to him. Okay, we're going to get started, y'all. My name is Jim Butler. I'm with the Kansas Geological Survey at the University of Kansas, and it is my distinct pleasure to introduce this afternoon's speaker, the 2011 Henry Darcy Distinguished Lecturer, Dr. Stephen Silliman at the University of Notre Dame. Now, I'll just give you a little bit of background bio info on Steve. He, uh, I guess, got his bachelor's in civil engineering at Princeton, then went to the University of Arizona, which is one of the top hydro hydrology programs in the nation, got a master's and PhD there, and then basically, uh, I guess you spent a little time in the USGS, but uh, basically from January 86 on, he's been at the University of Notre Dame, where he's a professor in the combo of civil and geological engineering. Civil engineering and geological sciences. And geological sciences, and uh, has done a great deal of work in a wide variety of areas. Now, Steve was selected to be the Darcy Lecturer because he have some, has some unique qualities. And the Darcy Lectureship, as, as well as the McElhaney Lectureship, this is more than just conveying the latest results from the research areas to uh, the groundwater community. This is about, also about exciting the next generation about our profession. So we want to have an individual who's got the technical heft, but also can convey this excitement that we all share about our profession. And Steve has done an admirable job in this regard. Now, for those of you who think, hey, these lectureships, this is just a great way of compiling frequent flyer miles. Uh, it is, by the way. It is, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you're doing it all, coach. Um, and but it's more than that. And it is a great deal of work. It's an arduous uh, activity. And Steve, this year, 2011, has visited 62 sites on, I would say, four continents, five continents with Australia as well. And at each of those sites, uh, well, most of those sites he presented both of the uh, lectures that he's offering, and he spent a great deal of time uh, with the students, uh, talking to them about uh, their research and giving them ideas about uh, uh, profitable areas that they could pursue uh, in their work. So he's been a great representative of NGWA uh, this year in 2011, and this lecture is actually the culmination of his uh, Darcy lectureship. Uh, this is in contrast to uh, Marvin Glotfelty, who will be very shortly starting up on the McElhaney uh, within a couple hours. And so, uh, but this, the expo is the culmination of the Darcy Lectureship. And so it gives me great pleasure to, uh, to have Steve come up here and talk about not only the, uh, the work that he's been in Benin, but also to give you a sense of what it's been like and the experiences he's had uh, over this past year. So please join me in welcoming the 2011 Henry Darcy Distinguished Lecturer, Dr. Stephen Silliman at the University of Notre Dame. Good afternoon. Can everybody hear me okay with this lapel mic? Is it working? All right, good. Um, I suspect that uh, some of the previous uh, Darcy lecturers have gotten to this point and have been able to present their work in a way that uh, says they've accomplished something uh, very special. I find myself almost on the other end of that extreme. I have gone through a year uh, with the hope of, as Jim said, inspiring some students, trying to get some excitement in groundwater. And what I have found out is I've come back from these trips more inspired and more excited about groundwater than I was a year ago. And I was, I've always been, a very, my friends will tell you, I've always been very excited about groundwater. But there's an incredible, incredible spirit out there. So I will be talking in part about the work that I do in, in West Africa on a sole source aquifer system. That will be the context of this talk. But I am going to try to highlight some of the inspiration 
that has really come forward uh, out of these talks. Um, it was also very interesting, uh, Kevin McRae this morning uh, in the leadership uh, group was talking about the, the mission of NGWA. And one of the things you're going to notice is, I've, oops, wrong, wrong button down there. I'm going to throw in some nature into some of this because I've had a, a wonderful opportunity to actually see some natural environments throughout the world through this trip. And I think it's important for us to remember that we are working for people, absolutely. But when we work, talk about developing water and groundwater resources for people in their natural environment, if there is not an environment in which to put those folks, there's not a lot of reason for the folks to be around. So I'm going to try and mix those a little bit in here today. But as I start this, it's extraordinarily important to me to, to recognize that while the turkey in front of you is, is standing here giving this talk, it's really a reflection of the work in Benin of a large number of folks. Musa Bukhari is a dear friend from Benin, Nikes Yalo. They are both faculty members at the National University in, in Benin, West Africa. They are gentlemen who are, have an ability to motivate students in an unbelievable way. If you can imagine the following, they have a lecture hall that holds approximately 175 students. Students will walk in at 7 or 8 in the morning, about 300 of them. So they'll be sitting in the aisles, on the stairs, etc. The faculty will come in and give a 75-minute lecture. They will then trip over the students and go out. Those students will be in that room without leaving that room for about six hours. You talk about challenging educational environments for the drillers, for the faculty members here. Imagine going in front of a group where they have been sitting there for five to six hours in 95 degree weather trying to pay attention. And yet Musa Bukhari and Nikkei Siyalo have put out some very, very strong graduates out of that program that are in their government water agency. A second gentleman, and I do not mean to insult anybody in this room or anybody in NGWA, but Felix Azanzi is perhaps, if not the best, one of the best groundwater hydrologist from the drilling side all the way over to the uh, theoretical side that I have ever met. Why do I say that? Well, Felix is the head of their government water agency, specifically in charge of rural groundwater wells. Felix really understands the drilling. He's done some marvelous things. If you have time, ask me about some of his innovations. Uh, he has been able to take wells with about a three gallon permitted capacity and double that through some very innovative technologies. But Felix also understands what it takes to drill, what it takes to work with that local environment. The Developing Countries Interest Group uh, yesterday was talking a lot about sustainability. Felix knows how to get the folks to understand their wells, understand their pumps, collect the money necessary to maintain those pumps. We talk about worldwide, I don't know if Randy Taylor's in this room somewhere, um, we talk about worldwide, maybe in the developing countries, half the wells not working. I have now been in Benin for almost 15 years. There are only three wells that I have ever seen that they are not working for more than about a two month period because the people get it. They collect the money, they do the repairs in very, very large part because of Felix Azanzi, so a tremendous gentleman. We also work with a non-governmental organization. Landy Lubanon represents Centra Africa Obota in here. That stands for Central Africa, our mother. A group of West Africans that are really dedicated to doing development correctly by letting the people in the local villages lead the development projects. A number of graduate and undergraduate students from Notre Dame, a number of graduate students from the university in Benin. So there's a whole lot of people that are re represented in this talk. First, let's start with a general reflection. I think I've already mentioned this, but let me come back to it. Um, I have gone around the world. I've gone on five continents. Uh, at, when Jim Butler commits me to do this, I put together two talks on our work in Africa and thought maybe they'd be interesting. Maybe they would be inspirational. And I think they have to a degree. But again, I have come back. I have gotten so many suggestions. Some of them you'll see in the talk today from my friends and colleagues throughout the world of how to make my project better than it was before. And also, just incredible global awareness um, and accomplishments that are being here in the United States, up in Canada, in Europe, in Africa, in Australia, just some incredible things going on. Um, so I'm going to take today's uh, bit of time to, again, reflect on my project, but really to in reflect on the international groundwater communities in terms of research, service, industrial opportunities. Um, and again, to reflect on the meaning of groundwater for both humanity and if humanity is going to live in the natural environment that environment in which they're living. So let me jump in a little bit um, with some acknowledgments from folks here, and then we'll jump into my project. 
Certainly, National Groundwater Association, the National Groundwater Research and Education Foundation, uh, strong supporters of this work, thanks to those folks to a large degree. The hosts in, all, in most of the 62 locations, just tremendous uh, people that have really uh, bitten into this and, and supported very strongly. Uh, University of Notre Dame, who was willing to allow me to do this. I, I did not teach courses this fall. Uh, as a result of this, they, they gave me a sabbatical. If you don't know Barbette Howell, get to know her. Wonderful woman. Barbette, you're not in the room, I don't suspect. No? Okay. Uh, Barbette is from the National Groundwater Association. She organizes, um, I believe she has a whip that is, is a couple thousand miles long to keep us in, in line, if I'm right, Jim. Uh, um, but just a fantastic person. I'd also like to recognize my wife and my boys, Julie. Um, unfortunately, Julie was supposed to be here today. Um, she is, if you've looked at your weather, um, we are in north central Indiana. If you looked at the weather map yesterday, there was this big white stuff going from north to south. Um, she could not get here. She got stuck back at home. So unfortunately, she's not here. Uh, I would mention that uh, this is my family, by the way. Um, I would mention this opens an opportunity for you at the, uh, at the auction this afternoon because I had purchased, Julie, two very nice tickets to the, uh, the Lion King show this evening at 7.30. They are now up for auction on the raffle. They will be the first uh, raffle item up there. So, so take advantage of that and get some money back to the foundation if you could. Um, so thanks to my wife, and I'm sorry she's not here. This year we covered three topics. One is the hydrology, oops, the hydrology of the sole source aquifer in Benin down on the coast. That's what you'll hear about today. I did a second talk on working with local populations to get them to monitor their own water quality. If you've not seen that work, come talk to me about it. Um, there's tremendous opportunities to, to use local populations to get very, very high quality data. John uh, Wilson down at New Mexico also asked me to, to do a little bit more technical talk in addition to the others, so I, I had put together uh, a third talk on that. So, so these are what people heard in this Darcy lecture year. Where did we do this? Well, we've done it in a few locations. Here's the spots in the United States, kind of flipping in in order. And we'll, I'll let you watch them for a few seconds, and then I will skip them forward. So that's where we were in the United States. We also got into the uh, international realm, so we started down here in Australia, went all the way around, a little bit of a, a clockwork there, went up into Europe, got over into China, and we did, in fact, get down into Africa quite a bit. So um, the NGWA, uh, this Darcy Lecture Series, really does represent NGWA in a number of places internationally. So I'm going to give you the summary of the, uh, of the talk on the sole source aquifer in coastal Benin, and again, I'm going to try to highlight some of the inspirations I obtained this year. Benin's in West Africa, as you can see here. This is a project that started way back in uh, the mid to late 1990s. I will freely admit that the person standing in front of you back when this project started was a pretty arrogant, pretty stupid American. Um, and I suspect that a few of us could, could claim that, that who have gone over to Africa. I went over with a very small drill rig and felt that I could go over, um, there was a group I was working with, thought I could go over and train some young men in a matter of two weeks to become expert drillers, how many of you want to shoot me at this point, um, leave them and they would continue to have a lifelong career in drilling after two weeks of preparation from zero starting points. I think you can imagine how well that went. Um, over two years we, we drilled two wells for $25,000, um, both were good wells. One will never ever be used for political reasons, it turns out. I went back uh, in the following year, and you remember that gentleman, Felix Zanzi? I stepped into his office, sat down in a chair the very first day I was in Benin. He was outside the office. He walked into the office, walks past me, and slaps me upside the head quite hard, I might add. And, you know, gee, thanks, Felix. Now, the language over there is French. Um, my French was not so hot at that point in time, but the word stupide comes across from French to English pretty darn well. And so, Felix, what's going on? Why are you saying this? Well, his point, in, uh, to make a long story short, he said, you can come back and spend another $25,000 here as an arrogant American to try to drill a couple of wells with your small LS-100 drill rig. That's not appropriate for our geology, and you can provide some very poor quality wells. Or you can take that same money, and you can work with us in our system and help us to do our drilling better. Since that time, we've put about $30,000 into 32 wells the shallowest of which is about 45 meters. Um, they are all drilled with professional drill rigs. They are all uh, with training in the villages. 
Yours truly has not been on site to any one of those wells. And I'm very proud of that fact. They are all done by the local drillers, done the proper way for Benin. A strong lesson. Um, another part of that lesson was all the projects that, uh, that I've talked about this year, none of them came from me. Felix Asanzi and Musa Bakari were the idea generators on these projects. So let's move forward to the project here. Um, this idea actually came from uh, Felix Asanzi. This is the coast of Benin. So here's Benin. We're right on the Atlantic coast. Uh, this area down here is the town of Kutnus, extends into the town of Calavi. Population estimate, pretty hard to come by. Somewhere probably in the two million range. This city, um, the squatters out here will be on hand dug wells and, and surface water, but the city as a whole is on a pretty good groundwater supply called the Godemay well field. And so we wanted to study and find out how how reliable that well field is. I, I hesitate to use the word sustainable because it's used so often these days. What's the issue with this reliability? Well, here's a year from 1950 up to about 2010. Here's your million gallons per day pumping starting about one before the 1970s. And notice our pumping rate is going up linearly. We're up at about 14 million gallons per day out of that well field at this point in time. Is that an issue? Well, I suspect there's plenty of water in that system. We're not getting huge drawdowns, but what we are seeing is starting about 1998, again, this is 92 through 2008, chloride in milligrams per liter. Starting back in the late 90s, early 2000s, several of the wells started to show salinity increases that were quite dramatic. Now, some of you who know the, the numbers here pretty well might say, well, it never got above 300. That's not a big issue. The reason this leveled off at 300 is that well was shut in when it crossed 250. So they have seen a number of their wells, about eight of them up to this point in time, that they've had to shut in because salinity is coming into the system. Question is, where is it coming from? The geology is quite complex. Uh, here's the Atlantic Ocean. Down here in the, in the lower five kilometers of the country, you've got a lot of uh, uh, beach barriers, so a lot of, of course, sands. You've got these lagoonal deposits in between. You'll see some pictures of them in just a moment. You've got the Junu River that really divides the geology into two pieces. Up here, You've got extremely old clastic sediments, so very, very deep, uh, semi-confined aquifer systems, sands, uh, silts, clays. Uh, we'll mention Lake Nakue, which is right here in just a moment. So a very, very complicated geology. And what we'd like to know is where is that salinity coming from? Are we actually drawing it all the way from the ocean? Yeah, are we drawing it from the areas where the people are developed in here? Downtown Kootenai is over here, quite a few contamination sources there. Are we bringing it from there? Are we bringing it out of Lake Nakue? Or there's even a suggestion we're bringing it straight down from the folks above them. What is the source of the salinity? Now, why is this an important question? Well, as I mentioned, about 2 million folks are living down here. This lake, Lake Nakue, is a saltwater lake about 10 months out of the year. We have no other source of fresh water, folks. So if we, as groundwater hydrologists and groundwater drillers, can't figure out this system, and it's not just in Benin. If you look at Nigeria, if you look at Togo, if you look at Ghana, if you look almost anywhere in coastal Africa, we're going to have the same problem. All the populations moving to the coast, in all those cases, we're starting to bring contaminants into the system. If we can't figure out how to solve these problems, we are, are telling a population of 2 million people, I'm sorry, you have to pick up and move because your water supply is gone. So that's the challenge for us. How do we go forward? Well, what we'd like to do is define multiple conceptual models. What do I mean by a model? That's everywhere from how a driller will look at this and say, I understand sort of what the geology looks like. Here's various options on the geology, all the way up to the academics who are going to put together a numerical model to try and predict flow and transport in this system. We'd like to define multiple models that would tell us different ways of managing this system and then study those models to ask them, where are the unknowns and where do we have to monitor this system so that we better understand how to protect this water supply? So that's the project we had going into this. Let's see where we're at. Well, there's been a number of efforts in doing a numerical model. This is a simple mod flow model, so no density dependence or anything along that line. Again, you've got the coast of the Atlantic down here. Here's Lake Nakue. Uh, Professor Bukari was actually the first one to come up with this model, so he oriented it at a slight angle because he felt that was the regional flow pattern. And what are you looking at on this plot? The wells are here. There's a couple of them up here as well, but the majority of the wells are right here. The blue lines are predicted flow lines. So this is the, the prediction of the outer outline of the blue here. It's the prediction of the region where the wells are gathering their water. So most of it's coming from up north, according to this first model. 
Not much of it's coming from the south, and if you look closely, not a whole lot of it comes out of Lake Mikue. But that model that was produced by Professor Bakari was done without good knowledge of transmissivities or conductivities, without any knowledge of storativities, without knowledge of the hydraulic boundary conditions or the recharge in this region. Um, really didn't understand the lake at all, and so we didn't have a good handle on there. So one of the first things we did is said, well, let's just play some games with these parameters, and we made very, very minor changes to these properties, and the numerical model changes from the blue to the pink. What's the significance of the pink? It dives down towards the Atlantic, it comes underneath downtown Kootenai where there's contamination, and it covers almost one-third of Lake Nikue now rather than almost none of Lake Nikue. Is the pink a better model than the blue? Absolutely not. But the difference between the two diagrams you see here says that without understanding these parameters a whole lot better, we are not going to be able to produce a good model to manage the system. We are not going to know what's going on. So can we go out there and begin to understand this? Well, we're going to have four components of our strategy. Um, it's, the components are going to be guided by our numerical models. The first area is going to be right underneath the well field. Can we get hydraulic parameters under the well field? Second one is going to be, can we understand what's going on in the coast? The third one is, can we understand Lake Nakue? And the fourth one is, can we begin to understand recharge in the system? Those are the four critical things we think we really need to know to begin to improve this model. How do we do the well testing? Well, that's pretty standard for all you folks in this room. Uh, you've seen it all before, although we're going to throw some twists at you in just a second. We're just going out with standard pressure transducers, lowering them down observation wells, uh, very fancy uh, protection system out there, cost about 30 cents down the road, plastic buckets, lots of duct tape, lots of electrical tape. Uh, this is a uh, Campbell Field data logger. Dump them in, go ahead and start recording response. And when things go well, we've got a difficult time. When they go badly, we've got an even more difficult time. Here's a new well, an abandoned well right here. So we're going to monitor in this one. There's the new well. They're going to actually pump that one to, to test the, uh, whether their pumps are working and, the, and the, uh, the capacity of that well. Here's their pump house. So we'd like to get them to pump that thing for about 24 or 48 hours so we can get a good pump test out of this. Um, they didn't quite understand that. They came back and said, well, we're willing to pump for about 30 seconds. Um, kind of went back and forth on that one. You find out in West Africa you barter for absolutely everything. We bartered for quite a while. They agreed finally to give us about three hours of pumping. Okay, that's a little bit discouraging. Um, but as, at least we can get something out of it. But then the second thing is they, they told us is, but we're not going to tell you when that pumping is going to start. Because um, we, we can't plan that. And so we actually set up our transducer here and it was reading every five seconds. And you notice we went through about 12 hours of, uh, of no data. They turned it on, gave us a nice curve for three hours, turned it off, so we could get the, the drawdown and the recession curve. We could analyze that one, and we got some parameters off of that. But that's a new well. For their existing wells, we'd also like to do the pump test, because we really don't have the data there. And so, uh, well, before I get to that, uh, one of the things that you might realize very quickly, uh, for those who haven't worked with pump tests a lot, three hours is not very long. Why is that a problem? Well, after three hours, Here's the drawdown curve that I can get for 10 meters away from that pumping well. If I move 300 meters away, notice I'm not getting much of my signal. By the time I get about 700 meters away, in three hours of pumping and, re and recovery, I get absolutely no response in my wells. I cannot analyze it. So we'd like to find a better way to do that. So we went and said, could we work with your current wells, your production wells? And they said, sure. We said, well, could you turn those off for us for an extended period? And they said, sure, 30 seconds again. We got up to the three hours again. Everything was fine. Um, went to this well. The, the, so this is an abandoned well. The, the pumping well is actually behind that pole. Put our device in there on Friday. The gentleman said, sometime over the weekend, we'll turn that off for three hours. Came back on Monday, and the, gentle, the gentleman's assistant came to us and said, I'm extremely sorry. His daughter passed away right after you left. He had to go up to his village. He could not turn off the well. So what do I expect? I expect something that's going to look like this. Maybe a little bit of noise, but I'm not expecting anything. What did we actually see when we dumped the data on Monday? We saw this. If you look at that, vertical scale, this is about almost a two-meter vertical scale. So we had one, two, three, four, five, at least six events in the pumping profile in that, in that aquifer system. This is not rainfall. This is not barometric pressure. These are actual responses. It took us about three days to figure it out. Um, for those who have worked in, in uh, developing countries, whether that's Africa or Asia or South America, you could probably tell me immediately 
what the response, wh where that came from. For those who have not, you wind up talking to the water company and they have no clue what's going on. You wander around for about three days, you wind up in the electric company. Well, Southern Benin does not have enough electricity. They have rolling brownouts, blackouts, and grayouts. What you're looking at is the power company has arbitrarily turned on and off their power without telling the water company. And so we've got this unique um, problem slash opportunity. Um, the problem is if you have a, a high density plume coming into a low density system, you do not want to oscillate your flow field. It mixes that things much more quickly. So that's a negative. But if you look at the, the time axis on here, notice that this particular profile started at about 22 and goes over here to almost about 42. The water company is only allowing us three hours in pump test. It turns out the power company is allowing us about a 20 hour pump test. So we can actually get some pretty good data off of this. So as a summary of what we can do in, in area one, directly under the well field, Yes, yeah, standard pump tests are still a great way to go. Um, Jim might be having some, some heart palpitations here, but I mean, there's ways to, to improve this test, but, but they're a good start. Our problem is they're not long-term testing. We've got random variation in pumping, and we really don't know the vertical connections between the aquifers. That's what we'd like to do. Now, as I present this during the year, what happens? Well, there's a number of groups in the United States and in Europe that are working with something called hydraulic tomography. You pump one well and look at a response. You turn that one off, you come over here, you turn on this well, look at the response. And you do that from multiple directions. You do that in a very, very planned way in the United States. And you can look at the mathematics and get some very, very nice data out of that. What do we have in Benin? We have natural hydraulic tomography going on because the power company is turning on and off different sets of wells at different times. And so my buddies in the United States said, hey, don't be stupid, actually use that information. Put your pressure transducers out there. Let them read on five second intervals. Put monitors on the pumps. And there's some very, very inexpensive monitors that'll tell you whether the pump is vibrating. You now are gonna know when your pumps are on and off. You can come back six months later and you're gonna have a whole series of pump tests in here from different directions. So we're actually trying to do that. We're, we're putting the pressure transducers in there now and buying the, uh, the devices to measure the vibration on the pumps. The other thing they said was, why the heck aren't you doing water quality testing? And the answer was we hadn't gotten to it yet but they pushed us very hard, so we're doing that as well this year. Again, not my ideas, the ideas of the folks around you that, that listened to this talk and really saw some potential to help these folks. Let's move on down south, down along the coast. Here's that southwest corner of that lake, Lake Nakue. Um, if you talk about changing your hydrology by, by human intervention, everything you see that's white is cement, everything. And so think about recharge. This was all sandy soils, except in the dark areas that were the Laguna deposits. Everywhere there was sand where they could build, they have built. And so they have fundamentally re uh, changed the recharge. They have not built in these lagoons yet, um, but you notice lagoons are cut by roads. Those roads are not on bridges. They are sand, um, essentially earthen dams. So they're changing the surface water hydrology as well. Um, we go down south. Here's the airport. Notice how close to the coast. This is the Atlantic coast. Here's your airport, don't try to land there. If you believe in climate change, don't try to land there in 2050, unless you got an aquaplane. Um, this is gonna be underwater, already has been on a couple of occasions. I'm gonna show you some data here that's quite interesting in just a moment. Go out west, we lose civilization very quickly. The Laguna deposits uh, tend to have standing water in them. Historically, there's been a lot of uh, longshore uh, flow along here, so saltwater, freshwater. As they build these little earthen dams in there, we're, we're changing that substantially. Again, a little bit of uh, civilization coming out there. So we decided, let's go ahead and try and characterize that coastal environment. And our first idea, um, Professor Bukhari's idea in his model was it was gonna follow a very classic saltwater wedge, freshwater wedge. So here's your ocean because saltwater's heavier. Uh, your freshwater that recharges in here is gonna sit on top of that saltwater. You're gonna get this nice wedge of freshwater. So if you're very near the coast, you should drill very shallow. As you get farther from the coast, you can go down deeper. Um, let's see if that model actually, that conceptual model works in this case. Well, I don't know about you folks, but um, some of the rigs that are across the hall, I'm not sure I'd want to try to pull them out into this environment and actually get them back at the end of the day. So we didn't try to go in with large rigs. In fact, we couldn't even go in with some of the smaller direct push. So we went in with manual direct push. Um, so that's a 45 pound hammer. Uh, we were going down about 10 to 15 meters in most of these holes. We did find out a tremendous difference between Americans and Africans in terms of the physical shape they're in. Um, 
My students and I, um, that is, I did not dive in a vat of water down there. I am that wet because of sweat. Um, we would run this thing for about 45 minutes and take another 45 minute break to recover. This gentleman by himself ran that geoprobe. He's from Benin, ran that, that manual geoprobe for about eight hours that day, taking about two 30 minute breaks in the entire day. Um, just unbelievable kind of condition they're in. But with this, you know, we could take cores, we could take samples, we could get water levels. So we did that, did quite a bit of work with that. We also went in with some surface resistivity. And again, you can get all kinds of surprises as an American. Um, we did this both in, in uh, if you know resistivity, both in uh, winter and summer J arrays. So we can look at horizontal distribution. We can look at vertical distribution. Um, what are the surprises? Well, there's Dan. And if you know electrical resistivity, if you, well, if you don't, it's just an electrical line. You're, you're going to lay on the ground. You're going to pound in four spikes. You're going to put an electrical current out of the, uh, in the outer two, and you're going to look at the response in the inner two. So here he is. He's laying out our cable along this path. And you might notice down here, there's a gentleman right there riding a motorcycle down this path. This is one of the spots where we're going to hook on a spike. And so I had taken the spike. And it was about an 18-inch 18, 18 spike, pushed it about two inches into the ground, turned around to grab my hammer, turned around not 10 seconds later, and the spike is absolutely gone. Where is the spike? Well, this gentleman is standing behind me. And he's just rolling in laughter. And sir, could you tell me where my spike is? And he just went like this. Well, it turns out that if you ask them what's going on, you might notice some houses there. If you follow this path down to about where I'm standing, there's a second group of houses there. Those houses and these houses are separated by a saltwater body that's about six feet deep. To get across that water body, these folks have taken these reeds, and they have woven those reeds into a thick mat that they can actually drive motorcycles across. My spike had gone through that mat, and it was six feet down in water. So you can get some, some incredible surprises out there. Um, neat stuff, but we went ahead and we did our analysis. And let's see if our analysis works. Are we going to have a nice freshwater wedge that we can count on to begin to develop our water supply? So again, here's the Atlantic coast. Here's the Lake Nikuhe. By the way, it's, it is connected to the ocean. Here's that Junu River that separates the, the new coastal materials from the old geology. And what we're going to see in the next, as these points roll in is locations, for example, with the red, where the contact between the fresh water and the salt water was estimated either by direct sampling or by geophysics to be less than 10 meters down, the top 30 feet. That would be great if the next points over here we're up here, and then the deep stuff was up here. Well, let's take a look. Some of our devices never got to salinity, so the maximum depth of penetration is 60 meters. Here's the points that were at 60 meters. We've got some points right down here where we are saying the, the, the contact between the salinity and the fresh water was less than 10 meters down, right next to points where we could see no salinity down to 60 meters. Here's the ones that were between 30 and 60 meters. And if you know resistivity, there's going to be some points that are more confusing. But these points also indicated somewhere between 30 and 60 meters. All we can conclude from this field work is that there is no way this simple freshwater wedge is going to be the correct model mentally to approach this. And so if we're going to try to drill down here to help folks get shallow wells, et cetera, we can't be thinking this. We have to think what? We have to think that complex geology really does lead to very complex hydrogeology. There's some pretty good evidence now but there is some saltwater intrusion coming up from the coast. Um, it's not this simple saltwater wedge. The good news is there was another uh, geophysics measure done back in 1993, almost 20 years ago now, where the northern extent of the salinity was almost identically the same. The implication of that is that the salinity is not moving up from the coast very rapidly. So at least we have that to count on um, in the short term. There's also quite a bit of initial evidence in terms of uh, PAHs, in terms of nitrates. There's quite a bit of anthropogenic contamination. Well, where does the inspiration come from on here? Because this is a tough problem. We haven't gotten very far on it. Well, one of our problems is that direct push. I don't know about you guys, but 45-pound hammer working on it about seven hours during the day kind of gets a little bit old. And so we could get down about 15 meters, but we're not going to get down 30 or 50 meters with that. We have during the year, and this has come predominantly from the drilling side of the fence, and I thank you folks for that, we've gotten a number of suggestions for other ways to get out into those wetlands and get our holes deeper. And that has been very, very valuable to us. Um, we've also, from the resistivity, and this is more from the scientists and engineers side of the fence, but they've come back with some better ways to do the, the geophysics. 
um, including starting to do some seismic profiles. A, a gentleman named John Bradford at Boise State has actually written a proposal to Geologists Without Borders to come over and do seismic with us. Some really neat new opportunities there to help us understand that coastal environment. Okay, let's go out to what, in my mind, is the most interesting of the three environments here. I'm going to take you out on the Lake Nakue. And I am going to jump on a little soapbox here. Um, so let me explain the lake very quickly. Again, coast of the Atlantic. There is a channel that links the lake out to the ocean. That is a man-made channel from the, uh, I believe it's from the mid-1800s. It's to get boating in and out of that lake. The lake is about 20, uh, well, 15 kilometers north-south, about 25 kilometers east-west. There's several rivers that come in from the north. The main one's over here, the Ueme. There's another one, the So, up here. You've got the Junu that comes in over there. Um, now, in trying to understand this lake, I've talked, it's a relatively shallow lake. The center part, as you'll see in just a moment, uh, doesn't get more than about two meters deep uh, in the dry season, about three meters in the wet season. I've talked to my numerical modelers back at Notre Dame, and they said, yeah, give me about $500,000 and give me about three years. I can begin to understand the flow in this lake. Well, where do we get some inspiration? Let's take a look at this gentleman. He's a fisherman. Uh, you can tell the lake's very shallow. He's actually pushing his dugout canoe uh, through the lake with that, with that pole. Um, where are we at? Well, you'll see the uh, satellite image in just a second, but these reeds are actually in the lake, so they're growing in the lake. These are man-constructed structures on the lake. I'd ask this group, how many of you look at those man-constructed structures and see really neat engineering design sitting there? Show, show of hands, how many of you, you see it? Got maybe one hand in here. Well, let's, let's challenge ourselves and see if these folks actually are, are better at engineering than we are. Let's go back up to that satellite image. And that gentleman's sitting down here in this corner of the lake, so let's blow up that part of the lake. From the satellite image, what are you looking at? Well, here he is. He is sitting about right there. This is open water from that satellite image. These are those reeds in the background that are growing in the lake. These beautiful spirals are these things. What are these things? Over the last 500 years or more, the people fishing in this lake have figured out the flow directions in this lake. They have figured out the currents at different times of the year, and they have figured out how the fish interact with those currents. The fish will come in, and they will actually swim and follow the outer side of this structure, which has a net below the, the water surface, into the middle. These are elaborate fish traps. These folks figured it out without our math, without our groundwater hydrology, without our, our Johnson Well Screen manual. Um, my soapbox here, never underestimate the local population in understanding their own physical system. Um, really cool stuff. But I did, and so we're going to go on and try to do science in there. Um, they, they didn't give us quite all the answers we wanted. Uh, there really hadn't been do much done in terms of bathymetry in that lake, vertical permeability of the sediments, or hydraulic conductivity of the sediments. We did want to get in some piezometer nest. Uh, we want to look at the salinity in the lake. And we want to set up some long-term monitoring. By the way, the most important gentleman in here, this guy right here, he's the owner. This is a boat. Um, so he's the owner of that boat. This is a rugby player from Notre Dame. When he leans off that side of the boat, three of us have to lean off the other side so we don't flip the boat. It's kind of an interesting balancing act, uh, you guys can imagine from some of your field sites, but um, this guy knew the lake, knew the people. Without him, we would have gotten nowhere. So let's go out onto the lake and see what's going on. Here's some bathymetry of the lake. Uh, don't try to figure out and read all the numbers, but the red is the deepest spot in the dry season, so this was July of this year. The deepest spot is right out here in the middle, and it's right around two meters. We get down to less than half meters through most of the area. The area we're most interested in is right here because the well field's there. If there's any recharge coming in from the lake, it's going to be from that, that area. The, my buddies in Benin did go back out, and so they sent me this data about a week ago. This is the bathymetry uh, at the end of the wet season. Now, everything has gone up by a half meter, so this is now two and a half meters. But if you compare the distribution, it looks about the same. And so we're seeing some, some relatively deep stuff out here, some relatively shallow stuff over there. So we're going to put piezometers out there. Well, how do we put piezometers out um, in, say, the western US? Well, we go to the ranchers and we get permission to put them out there. So we did that the first year. We went, uh, our boat driver, our pierogi went out, and there were all these fish areas. And so we talked to the local fish farmers, got permission to put the PVC into their, into their uh, fish screens. We actually measured uh, vertical hydraulic conductivities. We hand installed just PVC with rubber mallets down to about three meters. Did that at a number of different places. Um, walked away to, to allow it a week to equilibrate, came back one week later, and guess what? With the exception of one pipe that we had actually put too far down so it was underneath the water, not one of our pipes was still there. 
Every single one of them was gone. Interesting thing is, it didn't take us very long to find out why. We asked the fishermen what happened to our pipe. They said, we took it. What do you mean you took it? Well, we had really good uses for that pipe. It was very valuable to us. And we didn't understand your project very well. And so the value to us was a lot better than the value. Uh, the value of the pipe to us was a lot better than the value that we might get out of your project. So we've used it for other stuff. Wow, OK. Shows how dumb I am. Not, this has nothing negative on them whatsoever. They're being extraordinarily practical. What I didn't do was try to figure out how to work in their society. And so what did we do? We slowed down quite a bit. We talked to our pierogi, the boat driver, and we talked to some of our sociology friends over there. And they said, no, no, no. In Benin, you do it just the opposite way. You talk to the political leader. You get the local politician to really get behind it. And then you pick the most public place you possibly can. Well, how public is this? Well, you'll see in just a moment, but I'll give you a general idea here. Here's one of the boat landings. And by the way, there's a population that lives on this lake. Almost 70,000 people live on stilts without infrastructure. So think about some of the, the contamination issues there. Here's one of the boat docks for one of those uh, cities. A uh, very public place. We're going to work right across the stream from that, and we are going to install multi-level piezometers there. So we installed at seven different locations. Um, those things are still in place. Not one of them has been damaged. Not one of them has been moved or removed. How public are these? Well, here's the edge of the boat dock. Here's our piezometer nest. In fact, we've had to protect this with wood because the boat dock comes right down to here. They've actually tied off to our piezometer nest. It's where everybody can get to it 24-7 because the political leader told them this is in our best interest. Nobody has touched these things now in about two and a half years. Really, really, really neat. Do we get some interesting things out of this? Absolutely. Um, we can monitor water levels in these. We, originally, we just did it with uh, uh, electric tape with the Benin students going out to take these measurements. We're now going to automated ones with uh, some divers or some other equipment that, that we're picking up at this conference, hopefully. Um, what did we find? Well, we found throughout the year, the water level in the lake, in terms of hydraulic head, was higher than the water level in the sediments. We have downflow everywhere in the system. OK, so we've got downflow. Um, well, if we have downflow and we look in the piezometers at different depths, we should see some interesting salt profiles. Why? Because this lake is salty during most of the year, about 10 months out of the year. We get the, the fall rains, and it turns to be a freshwater lake. So we get this wild fluctuation in salinity, or so we're told. So let's take a look. What are the data you're looking at here? Well, there's three locations. One is up in this river coming in. One's over here in the west. One's down here in the south part. Let's just look at this one down south for a second. This is chloride on a log scale. So here's 10, 100, 1,000, 10,000, 100,000 milligrams per liter. Here's the month of the year, February through December. The black line and the red stars are samples that were collected of the surface water, of the lake water about 15 centimeters down. And what do you see? We see that during the majority of the year, we are at a salinity that's almost equivalent to the salinity of the ocean very, very close to, to ocean water level. The rain started here in August, and we dropped from 19,000 milligrams per liter to this point is about 15 milligrams per liter. And we dropped that in less than four weeks. It's about a three-week change. The rain stopped, and this thing just responds incredibly quickly. And so as we had been told, in every single one of our spots, we are seeing this pattern. The surface water is going fresh. Well. If this lake is giving water to the groundwater and the surface water is going fresh, we should see some fresh water getting into the groundwater system. We should see that in our piezometers. Well, here's our piezometer at one meter. Here's our piezometer at one meter. Here's our piezometer at one, two, and three meters. We're not seeing any, any fresh water get down into the subsurface whatsoever. So once again, by studying this field site, we found out that we don't know diddly about this field site. We haven't figured it out. Now, these were the data that I had going uh, up to about June. And so these were the data that were seen by about the first half of the Darcy Lecture Series. And these data led to an incredible amount of discussion. And that discussion said, well, you know, there's really three possibilities for why we're not seeing any salt water going down into that lake. Um, th there's a fourth one that I didn't put on here. Fourth one is, guy standing in front of you incredibly dumb and can't measure water levels. It's actually a recharge lake. Well, we know that's, we're pretty sure that's not true. Let's leave out that Steve is really stupid for that reason um, and move on to other ones. First one was, well, maybe we've got a strong stratification. You've got fresh water coming in from these rivers. It's lighter than salt water, so it's riding on top of the salt water. 
at the bottom of the lake, the, the part of the water that's soaking into the sediments, is still salty. Well, I didn't really like that explanation too well because it's only at maximum two meters deep. Over in this area, only about 0.4 meters deep. Got a lot of boats going in and out, a lot of wind. I didn't really buy that one, but it was put on the table. A second one was maybe because of the heterogeneity in the sediments, you've got these really complex uh, flow patterns going on where you've got fresh water coming in through some, some gravels and sands, and that's pushing the salt water back up almost as a, a recharge zone where your, your sampling points happen to be. The third one was, well, maybe it's in the geology. Maybe there's some old halite or gypsum deposits down there that are contributing the salinity to it. Well, we were able to, to eliminate this one relatively quickly by doing some, some geologic study on the area, but we really wanted to know the difference between these two. And so our friends convinced us to go out this summer, and we have collected stratified samples in that lake. We collected them in July, and we collected them again. The data came to me about two weeks ago or a week and a half ago. Um, and we're going to collect them again in the dry season. What are those data telling us? Well, what you're looking at is a distribution of salinity in the lake, beginning of the rainy season, in the middle of the rainy season. And I apologize for the quality of this. I, I couldn't find a better way to do it. But here's the outline of the lake. They're very light colors. The white and the greens are fresh water. So you see this river, the Ueme River, is really making the lake quite fresh there. The red colors are still up at ocean level of chloride, or maybe half of ocean level of chloride. So we see an awful lot of salt water in this part of the lake, an awful lot of fresh water coming in from this part of the lake. As we go to the end of the rainy season, um, essentially, we, if I did it on this scale, everything would be white. I've, I've crunched down the scale. There is no salt water left in this system. There's a little bit of, of medium salinity left in the southwestern portion of the lake. So the lake has gone fresh on us. So that explains some of our surface data. Um, interestingly, the one spot where we've still seen salinity is, guess what? right in the area that our capture zone, our most interesting part for our well field is. So that gives us a little bit of concern. But is this lake stratified? Again, I apologize, it's a little bit difficult to see. But whatever you see white, the lake was not stratified. We took, uh, we took a measure of salinity about 15 centimeters down and about 1.5 meters down. And over here, it's really windy. There's not much fishing. There's no fish traps. The, uh, this thing is mixed to beat the band. There was no stratification whatsoever. In the deep, southern deep part of the lake, we do see some stratification. Um, the blues are slightly stratified. The reds are heavily stratified. We saw incredible stratification up this little river up here, which is a very unusual thing. I'll, ask me afterwards if you're interested in that. It, it, that's a fascinating hydrologic feature. But for better or worse, the one spot where we are extremely heavily stratified, that means we've got fresh water, overlying salt water, is in the area that is of most interest to us in terms of protecting our well field. That is really bad news, because that means that the recharge coming in here is going to be saline almost throughout the year. In fact, if we look at it even here at the end of the rainy season, almost everything's white except down in this corner. Again, we're still seeing stratification in this corner. There is still saline water at the bottom of that lake. So what have we done? Again, based on our friends giving us some suggestions, we started some long-term monitoring. We're monitoring surface and piezometer uh, water levels, temperature and salinity down here near the influence of the, uh, of the channel. We're doing it right in the middle of our recharge zone. And as I said, a very interesting uh, little river system up there. We're putting it up there. We hope to expand that dramatically in 2012. So. In terms of number three, before we go on to number four, so what did we find? Well, I walked in that system um, thinking that I had some good conceptual models. Wound up, my conceptual models did not explain the behavior very well. But it's the people here in the United States, you folks here in the United States. It was our friends in Europe. It was our friends in Africa. The folks in, in East Africa and South Africa gave incredible insights to this. The guys in Australia had it nailed. Our friends in China had a pretty good idea what was going on. A lot of input into that really helped us out in this. Fourth area is estimating recharge. Because without recharge, as I think most of you know, if, if we don't know what the recharge is coming into our system, we don't know how much we can sustainably pump out of our system. And I'll be very honest. I am not good at estimating recharge. I'm also not very good at doing the density-dependent modeling over there. I've not done, had a lot of experience. But you know what? As soon as we tell the community that that is a problem for us, the community steps forward immediately. You folks are doing an incredible job and are incredibly inspiring for the future of hydrology. We've got from the Desert Research Institute in Reno, we've got a master's student that her master's is now doing the, the estimation of ET and recharge in our capture zone in Benin. 
We've got students from South Africa that have stepped forward and they want to do sedimentology and density dependent modeling for their PhDs at their home institutions, no charge to us. Um, we've got a gentleman from Temple uh, that wants to go out and do some toad array resistivity. As I've already mentioned, uh, Boise State is jumping in and doing some seismic for us. And so in terms of uh, this area that I could not really handle at all, this slide was not even in my talk at the beginning of this year, we can now say because of the Darcy lecturer and because of the generosity of you folks out there at the various institutions, we can actually address this. So, specific to Southern Benin, and then I'll make some more general comments, and then I'll shut up, um, which is probably the part you're really hoping for. Uh, so we'll get to that soon. Um, we have established multiple conceptual models now. We, we do have a better characterization of the hydrology, um, and we have begun to better characterize the source. What's been the inspiration this year? Well, again, I was supposed to go out and inspire you guys. It's gone the exact opposite way. All of you guys, wherever I've gone, have really intrigued me with your comments, inspired me with your explanations. We now have significant contributions to this specific project from the US, from Europe, from Africa, a little bit from Australia. It's really nice, and it's a really multi-component research. Um, again, Kevin McRae uh, this morning in the leadership was talking about NGWA, yeah, we're groundwater, but we can't forget the surface water as a part of that system. This system, we cannot understand the groundwater without understanding Lake Nikue, without understanding the, the swamps, et cetera. And NGWA members have stepped forward to really help on this one. Again, the long-term goal is to provide the Benin government with possible strategies so that they can actually uh, begin to manage this system. It's a sole source of fresh water for them. Manage it, but also begin to monitor their system because we're not going to establish which model's best. So over the next 10 years, we need to establish a monitoring plan for them to begin to understand that. Now let's go beyond Benin. Um, I did a survey throughout this year of, of professionals, every place I went, and I got some pretty good responses. I have about 240 to 280 responses in. They're from, from throughout the US, China, et cetera. Number of questions on there. Some of them dealt with professional responsibility for work in developing countries and the makeup of teams that should be pursuing this work. And I was really expecting to see some strong differences across the United States and some strong differences between the United States and some of our colleagues in other countries. Um, I was surprised. You're going to see a very, very strong consistency, and that's going to lead to some comments at the end of this. Um, first question, what is the role of the professional in helping to address water resource challenges in developing countries? Ask the question for hydrologic professionals, and then ask the same question for professionals that are outside of hydrology. The blue are the responses you see from the United States. The red are the responses you see from our international colleagues. Just in terms of uh, uh, number of responses, the first column is they felt that it was a responsibility of hydrologic professionals to contribute to this. The second response was, well, it's not the responsibility, but it should be strongly encouraged. The third one is, it should be strongly encouraged, but really don't expect it to happen. And this one is, it should be discouraged or should not be part of your job description. Notice a couple of things. A, there is a significant group that really believes that it is a responsibility. This is the one spot where the Europeans actually came out a little bit ahead of the, uh, the US responses. Uh, there's a little bit more view in Europe and in Africa, and I'd say in Australia as well that it really is part of our regular professional uh, job to contribute to, to projects that are outside of our normal realm. But beyond that, there's really not much difference in response. Most of us think, yeah, it's not a bad idea to get out there and do some of this work. How strongly we feel that, yeah, that varies from person to person and how we ask the question. But we all think we should contribute some. We feel about the same way for our friends who are professionals outside of hydrology. Well, a second interesting question. Um, if you ask, the, if we're going to start a water project in a developing country, who should be the lead on those projects? So the first question was, the lead on that project, in fact, the only people on the project, should be technical experts in water. And this is strongly agree, agree, disagree, and strongly disagree. This one was experts in water, plus some help from, uh, from people in other disciplines. This is experts in economics and uh, sociology with help from us. So that was kind of flipping the question around. Let's look at those three to start with. Again, notice almost no difference in the frequency of response, US versus our international partners. We're all thinking of this the same way. Um, we pretty much agree that the water experts should be out there doing these projects, um, but we're a little bit more uh, conflicting as to whether they should be the only ones doing it. As soon as we get a little bit of help, notice the strongly agree goes up. 
So as long as we have some help from other experts, yeah, it's not a bad idea at all to have the, the water experts leading these things. Um, should we have the sociology and the economics folks leading them? Yeah, we're a little bit less comfortable about that one. We should have some water experts out there leading these things. But let's look at these bottom two. This one says project-dependent teams. So, oh, yeah, now we're getting some pretty, some pretty comfortable response. Project-dependent team plus using some of the local stakeholders, the people in country who know their country and know how to do it. And this one actually surprised me, but notice the dominance of the strongly agree here. The folks that are out there that are, are thinking about these things through this talk or through direct experience really are recognizing that these projects are not hydrologists from the U.S. going in to help by themselves, are not Christian evangelical groups going into Africa to help by themselves. It's really a team effort where folks from, with the, the high skill sets, the drillers, the scientists, the engineers, working with the local governments, with the local populations, et cetera. That's a viewpoint that is being shared by our friends. What does that mean? How is that reflected in what, what I saw this year? What I saw this year is a tremendous increase from 10 years ago and how much international research is being done by U.S. institutions. And that includes stuff over in India, Bangladesh, with some of the arsenic problems. That in, includes an awful lot of work in Central, and, 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 in Central America and in Africa. We're seeing things like the Peace Corps master's programs popping up, where students can get a master's degree, spending two years in the Peace Corps doing high technical uh, projects. We're seeing an awful lot of professional and volunteer organizations pop up. If you had asked this question literally 12 years ago, None of these groups would have existed at that point in time. Engineers Without Borders is, uh, anybody remember the date that it started? Do you remember? I think it's around 2004. 2004 is when it started. Um, EWB, Engineers Without Borders, is already realizing that we can't do it just with uh, engineers. They're getting into multidisciplinary projects. In fact, I was out at, at Gonzaga. They've already changed their Engineers Without Borders to Gonzaga Without Borders because they don't want just the engineers involved. Geologists Without Borders, Engineers for a Sustainable World, uh, there's evangelical groups or Christian groups like Life Water International. Um, there's some collaborative university efforts going on. Some really, really neat professional and volunteer organizations. Our organization is really stepping forward. One of the most active uh, interest groups right now is the Developing Country Interest Group. And I would point out, if you haven't seen Steve Snyder's uh, uh, book on how to, uh, how to uh, install and drill wells in developing countries, ask him about it. He's put an incredible amount of effort into that. NGWA is really really stepping forward on that. Um, they're also providing funding at this point in time. We're also seeing some really neat international degrees. How about our international friends? Well, absolutely. In the last three years, we have seen new graduate programs where I work in Benin. We've seen a new one start up at, uh, in China with uh, Ching Mao Zheng uh, starting a, a hydrology graduate program there. We've seen a, a friend of mine from Purdue Rabia Motar started a new uh, water initiative in Qatar. And there's many others that I'm not mentioning there. There's also a, a tremendous number of established programs from Europe, from Australia, from South Africa, really cranking out. And one of the things that I've heard from almost all of these groups is an incredibly strong desire to see us get our data sets together, our ideas together, get them into centralized rep uh, repositories where everybody can learn from them. And that's particularly important in Africa. So, Opinion for the next 10 years, uh, we're going to see an awful lot of increasing focus uh, on integrated water resource systems. That means integrating the su surface water and groundwater. It also means integrating with the local populations, with the sociology, the economics, et cetera. We're going to see our ourselves walking away um, from projects where we're not doing adequate planning and analysis. We've just had too many uh, problems with that. So we're going to see a strong focus on interdisciplinary projects a strong focus on long-term uh, projects, setting up standards and monitoring so that we can find out whether these projects are working in the long run and are being maintained. Um, a strong focus on incorporating uh, local stakeholders and building local capacity. How many of you would imagine here in the United States drilling a well for a farmer or a rancher where you never spoke to the rancher? You simply drove your rig onto their property, drilled down 80 meters, went to his door at the end and said, you have a new well out there. If you'd like, I can show you where it is. We don't do that here. We do that all the time in Africa. It's, it's, it, we've got a real problem with that. Um, I'd also argue one of the things that, that I will argue for is there's a, bit, a huge difference between service projects, development projects, and research projects. Um, all are critically important, 
but they have very, very different motivations, and we need to, to understand that, and I'm going to just spend about three minutes on that. Um, integration of these is very possible, but if we don't understand the difference between them, we're really going to hurt ourselves. Well, what do I mean by these? A service project. Uh, the primary focus is typically development or management of an individual water system, usually for a local population or a small group of populations. A lot of these, you're going to find out that the personal involvement of the person doing the drilling or the person going out into the field is a major component of the project. Um, a lot of the, the projects we see in Africa would probably not happen if we said, well, it's great, collect your money, but there's already a driller over there. We're just going to send the money over. We're not going to send any of the, the, the folks from this Christian organization or from this volunteer organization or the Students from Engineers Without Borders. They're not going to go over there. We're just going to send the money over. Those projects would disappear overnight. So service projects really have a very strong focus on the involvement of the individual. And so we get some real challenges on those. Expertise of the team. Do we always get the right folks over there? To, this is not a, uh, this is perhaps an overstatement, but an awful lot of these are focused on rural populations, ignoring some of the incredibly uh, critical problems in the large population centers. Um, capacity building, really working with the universities in the other countries, getting their experts up to speed, often is secondary. So what do I see in the next 10 years? We're going to see some long-term commitment to stakeholders and capacity building in these projects. That's changing. We already see it. They're going to be interdisciplinary and multi-objective. So we're going to have hygiene and sanitation. We're also going to have agriculture and economics into these projects up front, not as an afterthought. Integrated water resource management and professional standards are going to come into play. Again, Steve's book um, on, on wells, a great example of how that can start. And sustainability, upkeep. Checking on these projects is a very important part. We have a tremendous avenue within NGWA to continue to contribute to these and continue to advance these projects. In terms of development, primary focus of large development projects, say USAID type projects, is development and management of improved water resources. So now that's a project orientation. The experience of the individual is far less important. Almost no uh, interest in building local capacity in a lot of these projects. Again, I'm I'm making some blanket statements that are not true for all the projects, but for many of them. The challenges are many of these are very large projects that have very large resource needs. They're not getting out to individual populations. Um, often the consideration of sustainability or long-term upkeep issues are not being properly addressed. Um, it can be also a very challenging uh, environment for those of us in academia to fund uh, some fundamental research. So where are we going to see some trends? Again, interdisciplinarity. You're going to see that in all three of mine. Economics, integrated water resource management. Significant strategy needs to come into play for large scale change in capacity building, increased focus on the sustainability and the standards again. And one thing that, that I haven't mentioned before, but we're going to see a substantial increase in observing the risk, risk assessment, something called risk compensation. When you, when you intervene in a population, what are the negatives that you bring with you? Getting into those types of questions. And finally, for the research, for those in the scientist and engineer part of this, Primary focus here really is development of new knowledge, um, really concentrating on innovation. The challenges here are, are the funding. We, you don't get anywhere near the NSF type of funding uh, for these projects that you would get for a project in your laboratory in the United States. Um, it requires commitment to a single location. Long term is incredibly important. Very, very difficult to fund from an NSF or a funding agency to stay in the same place and do fundamental research. And there's a strong conflict of doing the research versus addressing an immediate water need. I can't tell you how many times my students have come back from Africa with me and said, I thought we were there to save people. What I did was research. I did not install a well this trip. And they're very upset about that. And so understanding the difference between doing the research and addressing an immediate need, incredibly important. Where are the trends going to be? Increasingly multi-institutional uh, multi and, and uh, multidisciplinary. Gosh, you've heard that before. A significant opportunity here to begin to work with our colleagues in the universities in these countries. I would hope that when we all get old enough that none of the faces in this room are still around, that we don't have to be going to Benin, West Africa, being, going to Kenya, going to Tanzania. I'm hoping they're coming over to tell us how they are improving the groundwater industry. And so we need to build that capacity. Um, this is going to give us also a, a great chance to link the human and environmental challenges. And again, this incorporation of risk. I really think this is a place where NGWA can come, a, come together across the divisions to really get into some challenging global uh, exchange. With that, I'll open it up to comments, questions, and I'll thank you for listening to me this long.
Thanks a lot, folks. Do we have questions for Steve? I also like criticisms and suggestions very strongly. I've learned a lot this year. You look at the search template I've seen in some of the universities. Yes, sir. What he's telling me is he, is he is considering that. We haven't gotten to the point where we've actually designed the equipment on that yet. We also believe that we're only going to be able to do that during the rainy season because during the dry season, with salt water on the surface, it's going to be tough to get down through it, uh, get through that salt water and see anything down below it. So, uh, so we're beginning to design that. We don't know the exact details yet. Yeah. Uh, you were talking about trying to figure out where the recharge is getting in. Uh, I'm from the Puget Sound region of the Pacific Northwest, and we have very complex sedimentary aquifers that discharge to the sea, and we're toying with the idea of doing salinity surveys off the coast to see where the water is discharging and then track it backward. Uh, is there any opportunity for that here? I would love to do that, absolutely. We are convinced that there, we are putting a lot of fresh water out into the ocean. We're living on a project budget. Um, we just got some new funding at a much higher level. We're up to 60K per year now, um, uh, including the grad students and the overhead, et cetera. To get out and do those offshore surveys is relatively expensive. It's beyond what we can do right now. But we would love to have somebody step forward and say, We, we yeah. found out that some of it exists because the uh, Navy does their submarine sonar calibration in Puget Sound. Yeah, we need this to become extremely good equipment. <laughs> yeah, we, we need this to become a much more strategic in terms of the U.S. Defense Department, uh, and then we can probably get those data. Right now, it's uh, it, uh, we don't have that. That we'd love to get those data. But we don't have the opportunity for it right now. Absolutely. Yeah. Do you work with the Gates Foundation at all, or have you talked to them? And if so, would they support this local collaborative methodology? We have talked a couple of times with the Gates Foundation. Now, I will say it has not been for about five years now, and they they have changed their modus operandi quite a bit in the last five years. But previously, their response to us was, these are water projects. Water is not a disease in and of itself. They are there to solve diseases. So they, these were not the types of projects they were that interested in. So they have not, not gone past the preliminary proposal stages. They've not been interested. I don't know, a couple of the other folks, uh, Mike, I don't know if you want to add to that or anybody else in terms of Gates and some of the other funding sources. No, that's it. So, but that's been the response we've had so far from them. Additional questions? Steve, do you want to say anything? About, uh, you've got a you captured audience here for a second. Do you want to say anything about the effort that you're doing and, and the input you'd like to get on your, on your manual? Uh, yeah, that's good. Um, I'm Steve Schneider. Um, got this. Uh, this first publication of this water supply well guidelines for in developing countries. Uh, it's been a collaborative effort for three years and uh, uh, brought it to fruition in its first print uh, about a month ago at the University of Oklahoma, the International Water Conference. Extremely enthusiastic response. Uh, brought 50 copies down there and they were gone in, in, before I even started the presentation. Um, it, it's intended to be a guide and that's it. it, it it talks about well construction, it talks about well head completion, it talks about documentation, it talks about siting, all those important things. Um, and uh, in areas where there is no standard, it could be used as a guide to help get them started in a standard of mode of some sort. It is not intended to be a standard, but to give them guidance. And, and uh, uh, at this point, this thing's getting ready to go for a reprint. Before I left Oklahoma, I had an offer to put it in Chinese and paper printing. Uh, had a couple uh, potential endorsements come forward, and some have come to fruition already. Uh, it's uh, been offered to by several individuals to help assist put it in Spanish, which, and also into French. So it's it's moving forward fast. The, the project is uh, is kind of a one man operation with support on the outside, uh, so we're seeking comments uh, for the second print. There are several edits that need to be done in it. Uh, it's it's going to see the second English version come out in January, and shortly thereafter we're, we should be seeing the Spanish and uh, uh, Chinese versions, 
and French is going to be a little bit later. Uh, the, the guy, the first guy that volunteered to help on that, said he can't get right on it until a little later in the sprint. Um, welcome comments. It's uh, Mike's blog, uh, put it on his blog. He had four thousand hits, uh, something like that. It's, so there's a PDF available if you want to grab it that way. I have very limited, a few copies left of the hard copy. It's designed to be kind of a field manual, so it looks back on itself. Lots of graphics which is a kind of a universal language, so welcome input and support. Thank you. I see here it says please sign in. Where do you, where do you sign in? I'll get to that in just a minute. <coughs> okay. Well, you're not quite done yet. Um, as a small uh, <laughs> token of our thanks to this uh, great job that Steve has done representing us all over this last year. Uh, we've got uh, two uh, tokens of our thanks. This is the Henry Darcy Distinguished Lectureship. So we thought it would be appropriate if we gave Steve the translation from the French of Henry Darcy's original contributions, which have been so fundamental to groundwater hydrology. So Steve. Thank you, Jim. And also, so in the future, he can look back upon this experience and have something to remind him of it in his office. We have a plaque as well from NGWA to thank Steve again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sure. And uh, two other pieces of business. One at 3.30, I would strongly encourage everyone to return to this room for the kickoff for the McElhaney Lectureship. I think it's gonna be an outstanding uh, presentation as well. And in terms of the numbers, the sign-ins, if you need my signature on any forms, just come on up. I've also got the numbers as well for continuing education for this presentation. So thank you.